cool and uh, we want to but thank you for coming out for our presentation called Get Your Head Out of the Clouds, where we're going to have a discussion about uh, non-tobacco related um, nicotine products, such as e-cigarettes, but what we're seeing more at the high school is around vaping and jewelry. Uh, this is certainly uh, a topic that we've been discussing quite a bit over the course of the year. If I were to pinpoint one area that I've seen a significant spike in, in uh, discipline and discipline referrals, it's around vaping, where I think a lot of other types of behaviors have we certainly seen a decrease. Uh, I get together with uh, area principals once a month and I talk about all different types of stuff. And this topic of vaping and the education around it, what schools are doing has been a topic of conversation about in three or four different times over the so it's not just the top of my school, it's schools across the state, it's schools across the country. Come on, please. Come up, please. Come up. Please, 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 please. Come up. And, and I think it's the way that the advertisement is, is really geared towards high school age. So um, what we wanted to do tonight is have more of a face-to-face -face informational session. We've, we've tried our best to communicate with the students at the high school about what we're seeing, um, to provide them with the information about the concerns that we have. We've communicated to parents that this serves, other messages. Um, we wanted to have this opportunity to kind of sit down. I know um, we don't have a large crowd here today, but we do have HDM filming, so hopefully the people who aren't able to make it will be able to, to watch on HDM. I do want to thank the many people that came together uh, to, to put this presentation together. It's really a collaborative effort from the high school, to the public schools, I should say, because Dr. Celeste, our director of student services, has been very heavily involved, a lot in the police department, and Sergeant Bennett, and Officer Powers. Um, our Hopkinton uh, Health Director, Sean McCall, and certainly our Hopkinton Youth and Family Services uh, with Denise Hilbert uh, and that crew as well. So we have come together, we've met probably three or four times throughout the course of the last few months, um, and we were able to bring in some experts in the field. We have Dr. Lester Hartman with us here tonight, uh, who is, uh, works as a, uh, at the Westwood uh, Mansfield Pediatric Children's Hospital. He has a wealth of experience. We also have E.J. Wilson with us here in the front. DJ is the Tobacco Control Director for the MMA. Um, and we also have some school personnel here as well. So the plan for today really is, I'm going to turn it over uh, in, a moment, in a minute to, to, to Dr. Hartman. Um, and then after he's done, I'm going to turn it over to DJ Wilson. And then some school personnel, I have Mr. Pominco, one of our assistant principals, is going to talk a little bit about what we're seeing with trends, but also some of the education that we've recently put in uh, when it comes to students who either get caught vaping or any student that just wants to get more information around vaping. So he's going to elaborate a little bit more on that, and then we'll save some time for some, some question and answers. That sounds good. So, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lester Hart. Hi, everybody. Hello. I'm, I, I'm a pediatrician at Westwood Mansfield in Easton. I've been in practice 30 years. I took a, 31 years. I took a sabbatical in 2011 and went to Harvard School of Public Health and got my uh, master's degree in health and social behavior. I wish I had a teenager brain because I think it would have been more flexible and I would have had to have tutors less because <laughs> it was really tough in some ways, but I absolutely loved it. I've been involved with raising the minimum legal sales age to 21 in tobacco. I've been to 167 board of health meetings around the state in six and a half years and the house just passed it and if TJ can correct me on this, but I think the Senate will be passing it without a lot of trouble, I've heard, because it was 32 to 2 last year. So um, so the minimum legal sales will end up being statewide 21, which is pluses and minuses, because keep in mind, um, uh, much of what's going on in the purchasing world of vaping or jeweling, and keep in mind, when you ask teenagers sometimes to vape, they say no. You have to ask them, do they jewel, do they fix? or do they use SORIN? And those are the big ones out right now, which will be by far the biggest of them all. Um, we're now in the history of repeating ourselves, just as we did with tobacco at the turn of the 20th century, when it was linked with things like the women's suffrage movement, giving samples of uh, tobacco products in um, the uh, rations for military, and that just built a generation on nicotine. Now we're repeating ourselves to look at trying to connect to um, uh, get another generation. And kids at this present time are the thing Because we don't have enough absolute evidence to know that what's going to happen to kids. We also know that things like, and I'm going to get into the story real quick. <coughs> Nicotine looks like it metabolizes into nitrosamines, which are cancer-causing agents for bladder cancer. Um, 
And what, that isn't just for somebody who is a primary smoker. It's for a secondary inhaler. In other words, my wife turns out she got bladder cancer, never smoked a day in her life, lived with a highly, highly addicted, three, four packs a day father. Okay? And we, she was getting uh, kidney stones removed and they happened to see this area of uh, bladder cancer. And the only thing we can figure out with the urologist, and of course, you know, absolutely answers on this, is her um, exposure, secondhand smoke, nicotine, and looked up. And there's a good sized study on this that shows that secondhand tobacco can cause cancer for people too. And the estimate is about 48,000 people die, 42,000 people die due to secondhand smoke, according to CDC every year, as well as about 450,000 um, uh, primary smokers now. It's the leading cause of preventable death in America today. So, what age can you rent a car? Anybody want to tell me? Oh, 25. 25. 25. Yes, it's 25. Uh, this gentleman here, I don't mean to pick on you, but I love your shirt um, with it. Can you tell me why you think it is they went to 25? That the car rental industry, and absolutely the auto industry, went to 25? Do you have any idea? Take the time. You don't, you don't have any? Okay. Anybody else want to take a stab? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, let's get it in a more detail. Was um, the car rental industry looked at crash rates? They don't drop till 25, significantly. All right? So the neuroscientists said, because uh, they went to them and said, why did, you change, why did you make it 25? Why not 18? Why not 16? Why not 21? And they said, simple, crash rates don't drop till 25, significantly. So then, where, what are crash rates a measure of? We're going to take a guess. Judgment. Where's judgment in your brain? It should be taught in kindergarten, and we don't, as Americans, teach good science. I'm sorry. And the young kids, they need to know brain health in kindergarten, in my opinion. The frontal lobe. And guess what? When they did serial functional MRIs of the brain, the car rental industry was right. We as human beings cannot make optimal choices, no matter if we can go to war or we can vote, until we're around 25. Guys are sometimes later, girls sometimes earlier. So that's why you can't rent a car. There's huge implications for this around tobacco and things. So, then let's, if there's one thing to take away from here, then nicotine is a highly, highly addictive substance. And the most vulnerable brains are between the ages of 14 and 18. The most vulnerable brains to addiction. One in three people who attempt will become lifetime addicted. 90% of lifetime users began before the age of 18, 95 before the age of uh, 21. That's why we work so hard and we're the sixth state in the country to go to 21. The longer you delay, the less likely someone becomes addicted. And um, I'll tell you my story because my mother smoked during my pregnancy uh, as well. So, you know, what you see here is the intent of vaping is to addict kids on nicotine. Nicotine, you know, kids think nicotine is clean. It's just like caffeine. I just told you about nitrosamines and, and nicotine. And there are questions around fertility that may be developing out of this too for young women. That's very concerning as well. But they market it because the British has all this wonderful literature about, literature about helping to reduce smoking cessation in adults. And they try to focus on that. But who they market to is the 14 to 16 year olds, 17 year olds, okay? And, how, and what they're saying is, if this was a smoking uh, cessation device, why are there 7,700 flavors for a cessation device? That makes no sense, absolutely no sense. And they're trying to hook you. You've got so many venture capitalists pouring in money to places like Jewel right now to, um, to um, damage your health as well from this. And Okay. So I was kindly giving your data from your school called the YRBSA, Youth Risk Behavioral Survey. And there's some interesting things about this that if you look at, this is divided by male and female. 
Um, this is the combined use. And if you look at smoking, okay, and uh, it is, was 5% here in 2016 in females and 13% in males. And the predominant males use this stuff more um, than females. Why? We don't know. But look at um, uh, the amount of use of data, five-fold greater than um, uh, in women, and three-fold, two-and-a-half-fold greater in men, in males. This is what is happening. So in males, roughly one in three males in, the, in your schools is vaping. Roughly one in four females in the school is vaping as well. The bathrooms are a wonderful place. I'm sorry. So, again, by grade, you see the trend lifetime smoking gets up to 14%. Used to be, what's the max? It was 36% years ago. Mid-60s mid was that. Now, look at lifetime. Lifetime means you've you ever used, okay? 42% of seniors, almost one in two, have used these devices. And their brain is still vulnerable to becoming addicted. 90% of lifetime users of tobacco and probably nicotine, period, began before the age of 18. 90%. All right? And I hear from athletes sometimes, well, I don't get winded when I use these things. Well, you haven't used it long enough to damage your lungs yet. And that's the key to this whole process. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And again, when you use it by, by gender, uh, move on for now. Patrick, help. Can you do this one? Because I'm, I'm messing this up. All right. This will pass on. Well, this will pass on. Now, this is an interesting slide because um, this is cigarettes and acquiring you know, the use of uh, cigarettes. And where do people get their sources? 24% here in the bar look at bumped off people. 29% is other, and I have no idea, so that's over 50%. Do you know what other is there, DJ? Do you have any idea? I don't have any idea. Now, let's, and you, you find out, took it from the store, which means didn't purchase it, you took it, I guess. Because then they have bought them in the store in the town where I live. Okay. So, let's go to the next one. This is on Okay. No, you went backwards. You're as bad as me. All right. All right. No, no, no. Back. Back. We have one more. Okay. This is the e-cigarette. Okay. Forty-three percent of this was borrowed from people. Forty-three percent. Somebody had it, and they, people are taking kids in the bathroom and sharing. This is mostly the bathroom in schools where, where kids are doing this. Okay. Forty-three percent. Very different than tobacco. Okay. And um, bought in the store is, where's, where's the that's about 3%. <coughs> and then the key 12% is gave someone else money <coughs> and had them to buy it for them. You see, the concept before pre-internet was, the reason we want to go to 21, it's called social distancing. You no longer had the seller in the school anymore. The 18-year-old couldn't buy, so they had less access. And of course, thanks to the wonderful enforcement by our people like T.J. Wilson's group, we have some of the best enforcement in the country. <coughs> and what's it about one-third towns, though, aren't part of that, are they in the state? So <coughs> keep in mind that um, it's what their enforcement these laws are compliant with, and that's why they need more money. I can lobby for that. He can't. So. So, <laughs> next slide. So, flavor, flavors were banned from cigarettes in 2009. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you could not do it because the FDA was so scared about the huge uptake kids were having with this. Flavored cigarettes, okay? So, back to the next slide. So, then here's the pivot, and I'm happy to show you. And again, the great irony is one of the popular ones is mango. What's the most popular vape used with a jewel? Mango. mango. So, mango. And so here, here are cigarillos. 
These were the beginnings before they started vaping. These were done. These were done because, and GJ can get a little better detail than I can on it, a lot better. <laughs> Cigarettes, they made something called cigarillos, partly to avoid the taxes on um, uh, the cigarette taxes, and partly also because um, um, they can get kids interested in little cigars or cigarillos. Cigarello means um, cigarette in Spanish. <coughs> so this was the first in the process of trying to go around the law of banning flavors. And kids were using it. I'm going to pass this around. This one is it's pineapple, and this one's cognac. Okay. So pass it around. Notice the wonderful aroma as well. <laughs> so this is what started. Notice the cigarilla is a little bit uh, larger, and I believe that was also, by definition, cigarettes have a certain weight. Is that correct? And a certain weight, so they made it bigger. My understanding is that what they do to make it bigger and heavier a little bit is put wall or gypsum in cigarillos. So, so that's, that can't be too healthy for you. Now, Oh, yeah. okay. So then becomes this whole new technology age, Star Wars like. You know, uh, it's like it's like the kidding me. This is cool. You know, it's glitzy, it's digital. Wow, this is amazing. So to your left, quickly, is the tank devices that all started. You know the people that when they walk around the street, you see the billowing cloud around them, and, and then you go online, you see the guys making the O's and all sorts of shapes and teaching people how to do it. Um, a lot of toxins in that. And a fair amount of toxins in these devices, which is, the bottom one is, is a uh, jewel, and they're pod systems. And I'll show you what a pod system is in a second. Next. How does this strike you? Do you think that's, do you think that's, uh, Coincidence? Apple type white packaging. Do you think that's coincidence? The guy who made Jewel, who's making Jewel, who's a grad student at Stanford, nobly said we're trying to help 40 million smokers get off cigarettes without clear data because the CDC won't endorse this as a smoking cessation device, despite Britain saying it is. He was a package designer or something for, Zan for uh, Apple. So he stole basically, which was Apple would sue him for uh, patent infringement or something, because they stole it, basically. And so that's she, she, it's cool. Uh, if you look at the next slide. So these are the shelves of e juices. Has anybody ever been in a vape shop? I tell you, go have a wonderful experience. And do me a favor, go to your convenience store and look behind the counter. It's the greatest, greatest good waking of the American parent. Everything that's back there that your kids notice that you never do. And that's Cumberland Farms here I went to. Um, I went to, um, well, your Cumberland Farms is the big one I bought. I bought the, uh, these packs from here. And so, who's the target for 7,700 flavors? Kids. Yeah. So, let's so go into popularity with Jewel, which is the number one product. Okay? The number one product. It's gone up 60 fold. And boy, are the, um, are the um, venture capitalists drooling over the money they're making now off the help of, of kids. Next. I call this my Darth Vapor slide. This is what Darth Vapor is, the big tobacco, big vaping. They try to intimidate pediatricians and other people that want to talk about these things in lawsuits, you know, in states, costing huge amounts of money uh, to, um, to, you know, um, Prove, have to prove that these are problems as well. And that's, that's the thing. This is why I call this uh, dark vapor. Unfortunately, it, it wasn't original because when I looked up online, somebody actually has a product now called dark vapor. So, next. 500,000 people die per year of tobacco related diseases. Seven and a half Gillette stadiums full of people die each year. Okay, for tobacco. Alright? And here are the things you'll hear from kids. And this is what's so deceptive. It's only water vapor. 
99, there's studies, studies that show 99% of vaping kids do have nicotine in it. She too, but nicotine, okay? So anybody, any kid that vapes is, you can assume has nicotine even though they don't think they do, okay? I don't know if anybody heard of one called Zero. This was years ago, it was a disposable vape pen. And, you know, a kid brought it in one day. He said, hey, you know, I'm using this, it's on water. He'll get up, 0.04% nicotine in the fine print. But that assumption in your head, it said zero. How deceptive can you be? All right, next. So, let's get into the nitty gritty of these, okay? What's in these things, all right? Acrolein aldehydes. This causes popcorn lung. Now I've gone online and see the dudes say, you know, the stuff is there's so minimal amount of this stuff in there. It's not like the guys in the popcorn plant that inhaled this stuff and their lungs got destroyed. It's called bronchiolitis and glitter And they had to they had to even get lung transplants to be on oxygen the rest of their life. Well, you know what? We don't know what it's gonna do, but it can't be good. Even in low doses, this stuff can't be good. Now, this is predominantly in vape tanks. The claim by Juul is it's more natural. It doesn't have this. The problem is basically combusting glycerin, glycerol, turns this into aldehydes of alkaline. And that's what causes it. So it's a higher temperature. But sometimes we don't know how stable the electrical wiring and the heat is in some of these pods that they put in the jewel. So this is the concern, like are they still getting acrylene as well with it? So cadmium and nickel, that's in jewel, and that's a cancer-causing agent, okay? And accumulation over years when somebody becomes addicted, you know, my thought is, I think what we might start to see happen is more people take this up. Maybe the death rate will go down, but that doesn't mean it's any healthier to me or safer. It may be down, but the total number of people may in fact be the same deaths per year because you have more people getting hooked on this as well. You know, Juul has gone, our vaping has gone up 600% since 2011. So then you have, you have flavors. What's a natural flavor? Is flavors natural in your lungs? I thought it was natural in me. Inhaling and ingesting are two different systems, you know. Uh, Propylene glycol, that goes to formaldehyde and aldehydes if it's overheated. We don't know what that does to the lungs. It is antifreeze. You know, I get kids say, well, it's empty approved to eat. Well, eating something and putting it into your lungs is two totally different systems. <coughs> you don't have stomach acid in your lungs to process things. So this is the part that's really made. It's vegetable oil. Why is that normal to put in your lungs? Natural oils, that's what they put in there. I have no idea what that is. Finally, the FDA, is making Juul tell them specifically what natural flavors and natural oils are, because that's what it says on the bottom. I think it's the next slide show. Okay. All right, natural food flavors, probably glycol, vegetable oil, natural oil. Well, these may be okay for the sun. They are not okay that we know of yet to the lungs. So why is a product innocent until proven guilty instead of guilty until proven innocent? It's very frustrating the FDA has not pulled these from the market, has not allowed the internet to do it anymore. Because it's very frustrating, but I understand with the present administration being more, less public health oriented, they don't want to throw everything away. They want to go slow with this. But it's, it's sad for a public health person like me who just worked on going to 21 with tobacco and then get usurped by the internet access kids are getting. And they're under 18 when they go. Get this up next. So this is, this is the audacity part I always had a kick out of, was since 2011 up to, Till, um, um, 2014-15, there was a huge increase, a four-fold increase in ER visits for nicotine toxicity. And babies, if you put it on your skin, can become toxic because it gets absorbed through the skin. You can't eat juice if it's over 100 degrees can explode, and it has exploded in cars. It can erode vital on a, in a car, these e juices, and it killed a two-year-old in Fort Plains, New York, who drank something like Tutti Frutti, Fruit Loop flavored uh, uh, nicotine e-juice. And the reason the calls and everything went down is because 
they were forced to put child protective caps on fire. Next. So, I don't know if you all saw the CNN report recently about water alone, this, this girl had. What that really is, is the fancy name for it, eosinophilic pneumonitis, which basically is the lungs are rejecting and having an allergic reaction, which can kill you, by the way, because you can't breathe, you lose oxygen, you can't, you can't get oxygen into your body. And, and that allergic reaction may cause her permanent damage to the rest of her life. From this. this is the second case I've heard of this. Um, but there's another case study in the journal a year or two ago. Next. That device blew up in his mouth. He had, he had jaw fractures all over because, boom, there's fracture, fragments went into his jaw. His tongue was burned. And this is what the vague device. Granted, we don't know if Jewel is going to do this. I was looking stuff up, and there's nothing documented about the Jewel. But the vapor device did this. And if you go online, you see plenty of people where it's blown up in your pocket and started fires. There was somebody who was soaring. I, I like to go on Reddit, where a lot of kids go. I guess I'm trolling. Um, but when I look at this, one kid left his soaring, which I'll show you in a minute, which is similar to a vape device, on the whole night. And he heard this big, loud crack. And it felt really hot. And it turned out he forgot to turn it off. That's fire potential in a house, too, with a lithium battery. That's fire. So these are the array of tank devices, OK? To the right are the tank devices, to the left are the disposable cigarettes, or you reload them. You know, to the, mostly, these are e-juice that you get, and these are the 7,700 flavors. You can get these things next. More, even the pipe. So um, remember, do you vape? And then you ask, do you jewel? Do you fix? I don't know if Soren's a verb yet, but one thing you know is a product is successful when the noun changes to a verb. Jewel, jewel, fix, fix it. And I see that that's a, some kind of marketing advertising tool with this happens. Next. Yeah. All right. So as you can see, see that device there? And I'm going to pass this around right now to you. I'm going to pass you. And by the way, if you, if you didn't know it, I was doing it for a little while while talking to you. I didn't actually put a pot in, smoke it. I'll be coughing my brains out. All you got to do, see how big this is? Very small. Put it here. It doesn't build up the smoke like the other things. And I'm doing it, okay? That's what I'm doing. Kids in class take it and put it in their hood. And they hand them. So some schools have no hoods love rules now. With the kids are doing it in the back and everything. So, and you know how I figured this out? Shame on me. My 30 year old nephew who has drug addiction problems um, also has nicotine, which everything started from the nicotine, by the way. And, oh, there's a little fact to know. If you are addicted to cocaine, you have no greater chance of becoming addicted to nicotine. If you use nicotine, you have a threefold greater chance of becoming addicted to cocaine. So if you look, there is a brain wiring pattern that develops. And we've seen functional MRIs and structural MRIs change the addiction centers when comparing 16 to 21 year olds who, who smoke versus those who don't with the nicotine. But my nephew, interestingly enough, Sitting there, and he, he asked me, he said, I'm out of cigarettes. Can I use one of your jewels? I'm like, oh my God. So I gave him one. So you have to go outside to use it. He's like, oh shit. So I gave it to him. And he said, you have to go outside. About an hour later, it started smelling something. You know, not flowery smell. And I'm like, what's that smell? My two daughters were laughing their heads off. Matt's vaping in the house, Dad. And here I'm doing this. And it was Matt, my nephew, who was vaping in the house. And he would do, I, I learned it from him. OK? So I'm going to pass this around to you, a nice little light that goes on with it, too. It's digital. So is that a jewel is smokeless? It's, it, there's, there, well, it's vapor. But it's very small amounts of vapor. So it's not like the billowy stuff of 10 <coughs> So you're not going to see it fly all over the classroom, you know, with this. All right? And if you notice, it looks like a Wi-Fi device you can 
computer and a USB cord. If you think that's not intentional, and this is where I wish DAs would sue them, is the whole deceptiveness about these products. You know, it's only water vapor, uh, make it look like a USB cord, uh, device for the cord. Yes. So one jewel pod is roughly one pack of cigarettes. And you see these kids huff. And they, they'll, now they'll take a pack. I saw these guys doing potness on a video and, uh, today, and I found it interesting. And this is what kids are doing nowadays. And I just learned a term from a gentleman here who said to me, that's called Nikki. What they do is people inhale and they get a head rush. And that's where the, the addiction of the dopamine centers pleasure centers are shooting off now is they inhale Juul and Juul will actually um, call, will, will actually give these head rushes for a subset of people and they gotta keep having the head rush. So they gotta keep having more and more of it. Yes. So Patrick, can you show this brief video of teenagers that are addicted to to, to, to like Juul, to nicotine, particularly nicotine. So Patrick, how do we run this? Should we go? All right. Is the sound on? No, so this is great. Can you start it over? Yeah. This is the one that the tape. Yes, sir. You're saying you should better than this aerosol with a different or not? It's micro particles of water, whether you look at it any which way you want. And supposedly with the tank devices, you can adjust the size to, to be the smaller the, the micro particles, theoretically, the deeper into the lung of the tank. So we did it level. <laughs> they get it. It's not really aerosolized once it's got a spray with the propeller. It's not really, you're not really putting this on pressure as much for you to clerk. We can just move on because people need to speak. Yeah, we can just take that on you. Okay, yeah, cool. Is it ready, Patrick, or are we going to move on? Huh? We can just take that on you. I have a question. Do, um, do I missed the beginning, been. but do all Juul devices have nicotine? Yes. They do. All. All. Period. Period. 99% of what kids use, regardless of whether they say it's water vapor, mm -hmm. has nicotine. <clears throat> and probably 40 to 60% of kids who use Juul think it's only water vapor. How did they get that? How did they get that idea? You know. Yes, ma'am. How much nicotine is there in each pot? Well, it's 50, it depends on the depth and the length of the puff. So it's 59 milligrams in each of the puff, which is roughly a pack of cigarettes. But how many puffs, how many draws, or whatever you It depends on your length of use. On average, about 200. But it depends on how long you do it and how frequent, how deep you do it, because the inhalation is going to affect the number of puffs, because your supply is going to go down. What you say, 200? 200, roughly, is what the ballpark figure is. Anybody else had a question? Yes, ma'am. Well, it has 59 milligrams in a pod, which is roughly a pack. Right, but I'm saying like draw for draw. So well, again, it depends on how deep the draws are. Okay. You know, I mean, if you're doing a real deep draw versus, oh, you know, you know, so, you know, it all depends on the size of that. Okay. So, what do we the fact that cigarettes are useful in this bourbon? Right. That's a good point. And also, the people that are around you, right? And you are reading the other side. Can we yep. just move on? We're ready. Can we just move on? <laughs> Can you start it over? Yeah. That's a group.
That's a quote from a teenager who's using it. Huh? Because it's so highly addictive. He felt that, you know, and he got such a high level. You got the other slide, sir? Yeah. You get them? Yeah, yeah, yeah get Sorry, we got it frozen now, back here.
and they get it from other kids. No. And what you see happen, next, next, okay. Verify your age. Are you 18? What do you think a 16 year old's gonna do? Yes, think. So then, now, they think they're enforcing it by saying, do you have a picture ID? Okay, next, next. Go to the internet and get your fake ID. And you print it out, you, you, you send it to them, scan or whatever you do. <coughs> and they're not gonna ask you any questions. This is the serious problem with internet sales. There's no age enforcement, it's a joke. It's an absolute, total joke on the internet. And they know it. This is why I'm so angry. They know it, next. And people like, um, Jenny McCarthy. By the way, Jenny McCarthy's kid had a chromosomal abnormality from the autism with the vaccines. Okay, she's this person who's supposed to be the picture of health. She was vaping at one of the uh, one of the one of the um, um, Oscars or something. And do you think he's not getting any money for doing that? He's getting bucks for doing that. Yeah. Dave Chappelle. How many of you all like Dave Chappelle, the comedian? Funny guy. He's hooked hardly by that. What do you see in Star Wars? Whoop, all over the place. All over. And I don't think that's necessarily a mistake. Okay? I don't think that's a mistake. We all love Star Wars. And I think all these devices came out of that interest with the hookahs and everything that were being used. Right. What can you do for your kids? These are just a few things, and I don't know if DJ has much more detail than me. Educate your kids in a non judgmental way. You've got the handouts, okay? Spread the word. S send a product complaint to more healers' office. Go over healthcare, products, healthcare, and send a complaint to them that you want this stuff taken off the market, or you want this stuff better regulated in the state. There's not a lot we can control, because most of this is on the federal level, you know, as well. Correct me if I'm wrong with this, but if most of it's the control is going to be in the federal level since it's the internet state as well. <clears throat> Commissioner at the FDA, I tried to send him flowers uh, the other day with a sympathy card and all the kids that are going to get sick. Um, and it didn't get there because they had to go through security and they wouldn't let it go through. I've done it with gun control before. I've sent the Board of Trustees for Consumer Reports and the CEO of Consumer Reports, Dozen Roses, and ask them on gun control, um, you know, where do you, what, why aren't you assessing guns for safety and cost effectiveness? And the NRA has stopped them from trying to do that. So, next, the yeah, I'm a little crazy. So, my last little bit for you is going to be on alcohol. The most common problem we have in America today, drug problem. And I'm, I'm just going to say, women have skyrocketed in their use of alcohol in the last 10 years. Your book groups with your wine, it's a problem. It's becoming cirrhosis is going up. Fatty liver disease is going up in women because of the use of thinking that wine is okay to do on a regular basis. Um, and I just want to remind you of something. If you drink, you know, and your kids using marijuana, they have some valid points to tell you about why marijuana is safer than beer, okay? So keep this in mind. Um, and I'm not trying to be with the uh, group, the women group that years ago began, the temperance group, okay? But this is one of my favorite heroes. I learned a lot from him. In fact, I go to Haiti and I go to Cambodia and work there. But this is, example is not, this is Dr. Albert Schweitzer, which most of you don't remember. Um, he won the Nobel Peace Prize years ago. I love his favorite, his favorite pet was a pelican that used to walk with him. And he worked in Lambering in Africa. There's a hospital in Haiti named after. And he said, the example is not just one way to affect change. It is the only way. And that's what I want to emphasize to parents. Because, <clears throat> yes, you're going to die, more likely to die driving after a few drinks, even though you may, not, you may think you're OK, um, after a few drinks of alcohol, than somebody doing a joint. So think about that before, and two as well. Anyway, thank you, I'm done.
and I'll wait. If there are other questions, we'll wait till everybody else. But I probably already tapped you all out. So, oh, quickly, one other thing. Dip. Dip is very common. What sport is dip common in? Baseball. Not anymore. Why? You see all the coaches now using uh, sunflower seeds? So what do you think is the most common one? Hockey. Hockey, by far, is the biggest sport. And you take this little thing, and you put it in your thing, and it smells just like winter green, so your parents don't know you using tobacco. It has fine ground glass in it to can tear open your, uh, oops, oh uh, tear open your uh, capillaries to get the nicotine in. Russians. What they do is either in a glove, they shoot and make a little slice here, if they think they can focus better, and they stick these packs in there and just sweat. It helps them absorb the nicotine. Thank you. So my name is TJ Wilson. I'm a lawyer. I work at Mass Municipal Association. We're a trade association for local officials. Hopkins is a your town manager and select our members. And so a little about the program I work for. 25 years ago, we had a statewide referendum question that raised the tax, the price on the cigarette tax by 25 cents. That single 25 cents raised a million dollars every three days in the state of Massachusetts. And so we all of a sudden had this huge program at the height of it was $54 million. And at that time, Hopkinton belonged to a collaborative that included Holliston, and about uh, Medway and about 10 other towns. But we're now a $4 million program, so a lot of those uh, grants are cut. So I'm going to talk about uh, what happens locally. So we have federal, state, and local. At the federal level, two things that we really are, cannot touch at the local level, is advertising and product design. So a pocket tin can't tell this company to change their design around. Only the feds can, the state masters can't either. And we can't do anything about that. But what we can do, um, so my first question is, who's been in a convenience store in the last month? Oh, fair enough, okay. Because that is where all the action happens. Lester was talking about that. And uh, you know, sometimes, it's, especially if you're a non-smoker, you may just automatically get the gallon of milk stop and shop and never think to go to a convenience store. But going to a convenience store, taking your time, looking behind the counter, especially of an independent uh, convenience store, they're more likely to sell stuff that they shouldn't. Uh, take your time, ask some questions, look at the product. It is a store that belongs to that exists in your community, and it's okay to ask some questions. And for some reason, I think this is uh, the start of the end of my thing. Uh, oh, okay. Next, please. There we go. So we have two types of local regulations that we rely on in cities and towns. And as to the sales and second hand smoke, the history was that uh, the first vaping products were over 100 bucks to buy one. It was it's kind of like the cell phone of 1985. They were huge, clunky, and expensive. We never actually thought we'd see the day that they get down to such a price that you buy a disposable front of 10 bucks. So we first added the aluminum products to our sales regulations. Everything I talked about at the local level is available for Hopkinton to do. And so, because we thought it would be very clever to do that to kind of capture, not just some of those called e-cigarettes, but to kind of capture a greater these eco current and create a, you know, kind of move along with vocabulary that would change. Uh, and then the state omnibus bill, and this is the bill that Lester was refer referencing to, that has passed the House of Representatives, it's now going to go to the Senate, but the Senate's dealing with the budget right now. It'll do a handful of things, and I'm talking about local policies, I'll tell you which ones are in the, in the omnibus bill. And, but one of the things the omnibus bill is the expanded tobacco product definition of green. Our lobbyists who work for American Cancer, American Heart, American Lung, they helped the, uh, the Senate champion that we have, who's my senator, sit down and write out this very complicated product definition. But I'll, I'll tell you the elements in a second what it does, and it's to make sure that nothing, the industry, the tobacco industry does a very nice job of always finding the loop. And we do have no nicotine products out there. Most, yeah, this is an unregulated regulated industry, so when it says no nicotine, what we have been finding is that they do contain some nicotine. It's not purely no nicotine. But even with that, the Attorney General's regulation, she uh, updated her regulations two years back and included e-cigarettes, including no uh, non-nicotine versions. So our expanded tobacco product definition, what it does, it has traditional tobacco products. It lists a variation of e-cigarettes that go by a bunch of names. 
We've got also nicotine contact, and it relies on vaporization and aerosolization. Now, I'm going to ask you behind me about vapor versus aerosol. There is a scientific difference, and I don't know why, but I do know that the national health organizations like cancer, lung, and heart are moving towards using aerosols. I'm not 100% sure why. And then, but it does exclude those FDA approved cessation products. At this point in time, no e cigarette. No, no, nothing that has been approved for vaporization or aerosolization is used as a cessation product. So these are the specific things that we use with, that we have at the local level. Uh, expanding this, the no sales for minors to include vaping. This will be, this is in the omnibus bill. Uh, we have a lot of, cities, most cities and towns have done this. Raising the minimum legal age as your town has done to age 21, uh, and that does include in all instances vaporization, so the economy bill. Banning the sale of tobacco products in pharmacies. Uh, we have 155 cities and towns that have done so. Most include vaping products. Some of the cities and towns put this ban in place before e-cigarettes were even around. So we do have a lot that have done that, so, and you may have already seen that uh, CVS, for example, the target of two companies that by corporate policy no longer sell tobacco. One thing that we don't have a good handle on uh, at the local level is we can't do anything about taxation. Um, so there's a three dollar and fifty one cent tax on a pack of cigarettes. There's a more complicated tax structure for cigars. We do have a policy that local cities and towns can use to have a minimum price on, on cigars. Uh, but these, the only thing that's attached to that sale of e-cigarette is the sales tax. So unfortunately. Blue was one of those e-cigarettes that kind of looked like this a while ago. And they, they, they're catching the wave, on, and they have something that looks very jewel-like. And I was able to buy this at a convenience store in Burlington for $1. Uh, the owner admitted to the health uh, director up there that um, they go for $20, but the company will reimburse the, nine, the owner $19 for the one to for $1. So that's a constant back and forth for us because we do know that the higher the price is, the lower. Uh, high price of cigarettes prompts adults to quit and keeps kids from smoking, and the same is true with everything else. So this is really problematic for us. Uh, these two are not on, in the omnibus bill, but we have a number of cities and towns that have put a cap in the number of uh, retail permits that will be given out per town. Uh, and so and then we have this new section of the Burlington again that just did this because they just updated the regulation to put in a subcap. So example, Burlington, uh, the number's going to be off by one too. But they said we're going to allow 25 uh, locations to sell tobacco and we'll only allow four of those 25 to be either vape shops or tobacco Because we are seeing an influx of generally <coughs> college grad millennials who get a little tiny store, open it up, and they're, the, they're another vape shop. I live in the city of Malden. We have 65,000 people and about seven vape shops. So it's no doubt that some of those will die off just from that you know, business product. They won't be able to get the business. But it shows that it's, it, it, you know, it's, it's a way to kind of halt this, this influx of vape shops. And the second one on that is the most complicated one, probably the most uh, important, is as Alessa was saying, in 2009, the federal government ban the sale of flavored cigarettes. They did not touch other tobacco products. The industry then went out and bought a lot of cigar companies and came out with a lot of flavors. So we saw a surge in flavored tobacco, uh, cigar use. I should say we are in tobacco control, we are never ahead of the industry. They are always ahead of us. We don't know what tomorrow's new product's gonna be. So as soon as the flavored tobacco, the cigar, we saw that surge in the YR. We guys have in high schools that kids were moving from cigarettes to cigars. And now with Juul especially, you've seen the surge go to, uh, uh, to uh, vaping. So what started, when we started the program, we had like a 25% smoking rate in high schools. That's what the YRBS was telling us. We are now down statewide to about 70 80%. Unfortunately, we're back to 25% per vaping. So one of the, one of the uh, hardest hitting policies, the industry really hates it, to the point that they all sued that the city of Providence is doing it is to limit all the flavors to only qualifying adults only to, uh, tobacco stores or vape shops. So in Malden, it's only those six. We have, we have one tobacco business and six vape shops. So only seven stores out of, I think, 55 can sell a flavored product. So when you go in a convenience store, 
The only thing that can be left is plain or menthol. Menthol is exempted by the federal government, so we need to do the same. So what's good about that is it moves all this flavored product. Without flavors, kids wouldn't care about the, uh, you know, jeweling at all. Uh, so it moves all this flavored product to a smaller group of stores that are doubtful and we keep it ours. So it's been a very uh, uh, Worcester, uh, out this way you may be reading, if you get the Worcester telegram, Worcester just put it in place. And it's going to be placed on January 1st. Boston's already had already had it. So usage, the usage of vapor, of uh, vapor. The state's uh, smoke-free workplace law went into effect in 2004. At that time, there was no vaping. We thought we were being really smart by including uh, anything that we can possibly inhale in the smoking definition to capture not only regular tobacco but also herbal cigarettes and closed cigarettes. However. Uh, we, we don't consider e-cigarettes to be in that combustion because it really doesn't, it's no combustion. So we haven't done so. But what we have seen is 134 cities and towns that have said, wherever the smoke-free state law extends to and wherever our local regulation makes it, requires it to be smoke-free, there can be no vaping. So that's, so, and our health, public health reasons are, is that you could be sitting next to somebody this at a, at a bar and you have just zero idea what this liquid that's sloshing around while they're sitting next to you. And, and so, the, so just like second, it's probably not as dangerous secondhand smoke, but we don't know what the dangers are. This, uh, this will also be a compromise bill. And lastly, uh, schools that can add this to their student handbook and treat it just like smoking. I don't know if your school system has. Uh, so that's good. But obviously, it's, it's a tougher whack a mole game because, uh, you know, especially the Julian doesn't have much vapor. So again, this is really the reason why that Lester's talking about. Educate yourself on a variety of products. The tech industry is always ahead of us. The next thing that's going to be teed up for us in the United States will be this IQOS. It's IQOS. It's already sold in Europe and in Japan by Philip Morris. And it also it, uh, it actually um, heats up real tobacco leaves so it doesn't combust them. And so, so that's the next thing we'll probably see. And last, so there's the FDA again. I mean, I think the two things to say the FDA, he pointed out, one of them was to say, the real problem here is mail order. We managed to really get down to stop having people buying packs of cigarettes online, mostly from the Mohawk Reservation of safety. And for that, it's still wild west for vaping for for products. So the two things that I wish the FDA would do is to say, no mail order and no, and no, and no flavor. Those two things would go a long way to crushing uh, this uh, phenomenon. And then remember that even when you see something that says non-nicotine, it probably does have nicotine, and the reason I would care about it is it to nicotine addiction, and a more likely chance that people will move on. Uh, it was, you know, Lester uh, Stanford did the opposite. He ran out of cigarettes, so then he used to jewel, but usually what the opposite would be is that you run, your, you run out of liquid in here, and you bomb a cigarette. And then uh, someone asked earlier about the, the equivalency. It's very difficult for us. We all know people who smoke, and we all know that people reference their smoking by how much, how many sticks they smoke. They smoke half a pack a day, two and a half, two and a half, we don't have two and a half pack a day smokers anymore in the city of uh, But, or three, three cigarettes a day. The vaping is very different. It's very, it's, it's apples and oranges. It's very hard to know what, how much a person could conceivably um, through a regular cigarette and three inhales if they had just gotten off the plane after six hours of flying. Of course, a kid could also pound through this really quickly. So it's hard to know what average use is, what low use is, and, and if the person who's using one of these a day is actually you know, more addicted than they were when they actually were smoking. And part of that is because we've done such a good job, we all enjoy going out to eat, to going to a bunch of different places in Massachusetts. And never thinking about cigarette smoke, so we're somewhere else like Tennessee, like how can I smell cigarettes? But, so we really narrowed down the places that a uh, cigarette smoke can basically, there's no room in the, in, on the planet for a regular, a person my age to pound down 60 cigarettes. There's just no time in their day. But with these, they can do a better job of doing that. So we're, we are a little afraid that we're going to leave the people who actually use traditional tobacco are going to raise it.
um, different trends and kind of give context to what we're seeing within the school building and kind of talk about some of the changes and different programs that we've been able to bring in over the course of the year to kind of help to combat um, the vaping that we're seeing. So just as a general um, context, last year, um, the second semester last year, which begins in, in January and runs through June, we had four incidences of students who became, they got disciplinary consequences for tobacco related situations. So just to let you know how our handbook was written last year, Anything related to having a jewel, having any kind of device, having um, e-juice, it all follows kind of under the same umbrella. So last year in the second semester, we had four instances where students were either jeweling, or, I'm sorry, they were using the tank devices, or they had e-juice on them, and we only had four. What we noticed in this fall semester, we saw a rapid increase, and it kind of coincided with some of the information that was shared because of the rise of jeweling across the board. A lot of those high schools were dealing with this, but what we saw was basically a five-time increase. So in the fall, what we were in, what we were seeing was, and it started really at the beginning of the school year and kind of ran through most of the first semester, but what we saw was that any Jew-related or paraphernalia-related situations, it actually accounted for 30% of our non-attendance-related disciplinary infractions, which is a dramatic increase and obviously an area for concern. So as we were discussing what is the best way to combat this, we wanted to kind of come at it from two different perspectives. One is looking at what was in place for consequences, because that is an element of it, but anybody that has ever dealt with addiction knows consequences are a deterrent. It does help, but it's not going to solve the problem. It has to be an educational component. So what we did was we looked at our current handbook, and the consequences, briefly, it was one day of in-school suspension for the first offense, the second offense, out of school suspension for one day. Third offense and subsequent offenses, then you would look at multiple days of out of school suspension. That tact had worked up until the fall, but we noticed that there were students that really were seen two, three times, which is really unusual. It's a pretty significant consequence. Missing one day for in school suspension is significant. Missing a day for in school and then a day for out of school suspension for our students at Hopkinton High School, that is a huge, huge impact on them to miss that much school. So even despite that, we weren't really seeing the return on that. We still see students that were having that second offense, that third offense. So what we wanted to do was look at raising that and making that um, a little bit more significant. So one change that we made going into second semester was we went to the school committee and discussed the option of removing the in-school suspension in that first offense going right to an out-of-school suspension. And then second offense, then it would be subsequent and we would increase it from there. But again, that's part of it. We also wanted to increase the educational component. So what we wanted to do, and we were able to work in collaboration with some town organizations, where we were able to have Genesis come in, and we were able to set up an educational component. So if a student was caught with a jewel, they would be given the option to participate in a three-hour training and three-hour educational session after school, and we would set the dates for that. And there's a lot of information that goes along with that, but we have experts from Genesis that come in and educate the students as it relates to the dangers of vaping and just the addiction element of it, because that's a huge piece. It's not merely, as we were talking about, there's a lot of terminology for vaping, for jeweling, all those different things, but really the root of it is that addiction piece, and that's really the fear that we have. We want to educate students around that. So we have begun that. We're actually, we've already had two sessions, and we have the third one coming up next week. And then after that, we're actually going to begin another three-week session. Um, this is, again, in partnership with Genesis. So we're taking a look to see how it works, to see the effectiveness of it. Our school nurse is also participating in it. So hopefully, what she'll be able to do is, moving forward, be able to take that and be able to continue that through our services here at the school. In addition to that, we are also working with our wellness department to increase their knowledge around vaping and be able to incorporate that more into the wellness curriculum so students are seeing that from day one into the high school. So we're kind of trying to come at it from both of those perspectives. Obviously, the education piece, a lot of area high schools do it in a lot of different ways. Um, we think that by increasing the knowledge, nights like this, and also just in classrooms so that they can understand the addiction element of it and how that impacts them, is a far more effective and long term solution than just the suspensions and consequences alone like that. Now, some consequences, especially for students that participate in athletics, they have an MIA consequence, and it's 
25% of their season the first time that they get caught. And that covers all paraphernalia. So that's if they're caught dueling, if they're caught with a pod, an empty, uh, an empty pod in their pocket, a charger, all those things kind of go under that same umbrella. So in addition to the educational piece, the increase in consequences in our handbook, we're also just in general trying to increase the monitoring. Obviously, as you saw the statistics over there, those are very, very scary statistics. And we want to make sure that by increasing the monitoring in the bathrooms, increasing just in the hallway, have conversations like that, through all those means, we're hoping that that's going to be able to kind of diminish the amount of vaping that we're seeing. I will say that early results are that it has been a very positive increase in the second semester. We've gone down significantly. Uh, we've only had six instances. Um, in which students are talking about vaping or fueling or with paraphernalia in the spring semester, which is a major, which is a major decrease from the first semester, which would say that some of these techniques are working and some of the things that we're putting in place are working. Obviously, students are getting better with fueling, so that's something we're going to continue to combat. We're getting a lot, as the speaker showed, we're getting a lot more discreet with it, but it's something that we're going to continue looking at and hopefully be able to diminish in addition. But as you can see, we've kind of put things in place over the course of this year with that education piece that I hope is going to really have benefits in the future. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah. Um, I'm fine. I work at high school, and I would so much rather see the kids doing in school suspension with education right there. Because all that it seems like we're doing is we let them go out. They're going out and they're addicted, and they're vaping all day while they're out of school. And the other thing, plus we lose all the academic and all that stuff. The other challenge we're having is that kids are doing it not just in the bathroom in the hallways, but right in the classrooms. And as soon as the teacher turns their back, they're doing it. And other kids are reporting it to us. And, um, and then we also have a challenge with parents who are telling kids that they'd rather have to date than smoke pot or rather have to date than, than smoke cigarettes. And so we have a real challenge. Well, yeah, I agree. And one of the things that we did earlier this year is we did send out uh, we sent out a long letter with examples, visual examples, because I think there's a huge educational piece. I know that whenever I meet with a parent after the child has been in trouble for possession of some kind of um, e-cigarette related paraphernalia or gets caught vaping in the bathroom, like that, one of the biggest things, one of the first things we do is always share with them, this is what they look like, this is how this works, because we're all on a learning curve, every single one of us. And I will say that personally, as an administrator, it has been a very eye-opening experience over the course of this year, from the fall to now. Um, we have tried, and I think most parents here would have received that letter through, e through email with, with pictures. And I will say that tank devices, we don't see many tank devices anymore. It is almost 100% dual devices at this point. We've also worked with our teachers. Um, we had an ed camp on professional development day where one whole session was dedicated to vaping. Asking, they asked questions about it. They increased their knowledge of it. So by having those open conversations and kind of understanding, we're not going to know every detail of it, but if we're all looking at the same things, there's a communal aspect to vaping that is really crucial to understand because, and one of the things that we know from Juuling, one of the reasons that Juuling is so popular is because it is a communal element. You don't see a lot of students singularly dueling by themselves. That does happen, but more likely you're going to walk into the bathroom and see five or six people standing around a circle. Understanding the psychology of it from a communal aspect is really crucial because you can say don't jewel and there's a physical addiction to it, but also understanding that piece of it, it's tough to replace that. You have to find something to substitute that. And kind of looking at it from that perspective, sharing that with teachers and letting them know that kind of some of the things you just demonstrated, it doesn't take much. Very discreet and still hit the jewel. So it's really important for teachers to understand what they're looking for. And I will say that our teachers and students have voiced a lot of frustration over that and are more than willing to, to do those kinds of things. They want to have a school in which that's not that's not the norm. They want to be able to go in the bathroom and not have to deal with those kind of things. Students and teachers are left. So that's all that's been a positive when we brought it up during the class meetings uh, at the beginning of the second semester. Some students were very excited about because they don't want to go back to the they don't want to walk in a bunch of kids or feel uncomfortable going in there. So those are the, some of the other educational components that we're trying to put in place. So Justin, you talked about, I'm kind of learning on the process here, um, to address the technical in-school versus out of suspension. I think a big part of this, that we did have class meetings, and we kind of got a lot of 
lot of it was to tell them they would be suspended out of school. I think that stopped a lot of kids from getting in trouble. So it wasn't like suddenly they got in trouble and were out of school to find that. Um, but I will say, I don't think this is kind of a side attention, but they, they we want our kids in school when possible. So it was more about sending a message. And the other thing is, ideally, we're not passing the kids to the school in that moment. I think that would be wonderful. So the question is kind of, you know, they are out of school. But I just think, you know, we were at, at the school, like, mm -hmm. definitely, I mean, totally agree. It's better than to be here and educated and do the work and sitting at home watching Netflix. Mm -hmm. um, but it was much more about a message. Like, we take this as seriously as we do, but that's what we do all along. And we, we hate to send messages. Yeah. It's not typically the way that we go about our business. But this is one of these things where we, we couldn't get our heads around it. Just continue to keep happening. And a lot of times with the same students. And a little bit of a difference between in school and out of school. And out of school suspension oftentimes has to be important when you apply to college. In school suspension is not. So it carries with a little bit more weight than the consequences. So those are the types of things that we were we were trying, we have seen a difference. Again, yeah. that is not the go-to move in this administration. Never has been this was one of those things we were really trying to So and to incentivize to incentivize the educational piece, one thing as I stated for this semester, now that we have the Genesis program and the education piece in place, what we're able to do is if a student were to get caught tomorrow, they would have the opportunity to we would present that to them and say you have to do the education. If you choose not to do the education, then you receive the out of school suspension. If you don't, then you choose the educational piece, which you want to get them in front of the experts that have those discussions and hopefully trigger that thing and educate them so they understand the dangers that are coming. So to Mr. Bishop's point, when we talk about out of school suspension, it's not something that any of us take lightly. It's easy to say just you're out of the building, but it doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't bring that person back into the fold. And the reality is that you're sending, you're saying that this person is leaving, and then you're sending them home where they have a lot of construction time. See, and it's not, it's not a good, it's not a good combination. So hopefully, by incentivizing it so that they do say for the education piece, they have to be there for the three hours. They have to do that. Hopefully, that it kind of gets through to them, and then they don't have to worry about the suspension piece. And then, if we do that for subsequent situations, we can start seeing more of that. We have, which is fortunate. We have seen a market decrease. And I think I don't expect a price spike in the next few weeks. So I think that those numbers will have gone down dramatically, but hopefully that was a spike that we saw first semester. We made some adjustments and hopefully we continue to work the educational components so that we see it continue to increase. What you're describing is education based on this sort of Popularity issues with it, but more on the physical what 
also something we need to consider what we should do. Have you seen any of those other products before? The other ones? This one's a third teardrops now. Yeah, it's like a lot of them. I've seen them. What grade do you guys? still evolving around this. There's not enough studies, human studies on this yet. And it took 40 to 50 years before tobacco actually started to be associated with cancer. Even though Abraham Lincoln told Grant he needed to stop or he was going to get cancer. And what did he die from? Laryngeal cancer from his cigars. So my point of the matter is, is there's a lot more to come on how this can damage your bodies that we don't know yet. And we can't definitively say but we're going back through what tobacco did to your grandparents and even some of your parents. Alright, so now to put my kids on the spot, but I'm going to. Um, I think what we want to know as adults is do you find, do you think that this would be beneficial to present for a school time? Um, I think it's less of that like kids aren't going to really care what you need them in the long run. I think what you have to stress is that it's not respectful. Like if you're going to go out of your way to say like once or twice or three times not to do that in school, if you're going to do it yourself, don't do it in a public space to be able to do it. I guess anything other than that one will be able to see that. In, in reality, that was going to be restaurant smoke free, right? right? Mm -hmm. Kind of mandated that it was disrespectful to make the same kind of restaurant. And so then people got used to that. Oh, yeah, as a student goes here, I mean, it was very I actually have no idea what happened to them. You guys talked about it. I don't think personally, so I don't know. It was very unusual. But I think, um, like she said, that I think um, if you're going to do it again, I think you should do it in like, school. I think that maybe you need to be respectful. Because as a student, I actually had to walk into the way after we teach them. I was like, I'm going to take it. It was very like, great. And I think that I had friends who actually were physically um, a provider. Charger, 
And so you're out of your seat. Okay. And it's worth like it's worth like that because obviously the number of games because every every sport has different numbers of games, but it's 25 percent in the first offense. And second offense, you can sell it. Uh, it's yeah, it's either between 60 and 75. And then third offense, third game. That also for, that also goes to postseason. And when it comes to MIA offenses, it also carries over to the next sport on the left. So if you are a spring athlete. Or a better example would be if you're a winter athlete, you don't play anything in the, in the spring, yeah. but your next sport is soccer, then you deal with the 25% carryover side. I understand also that um, it's all uh, extracurricular, right? Yeah. So if you're a senior coming up to season, you can get caught and you can't do any of the senior activities, right? It's a possibility, yeah. It's, That's sort of the way it's written now. Um, Thank you so much for coming.